Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode. Hopefully, we'll make it to, you know, episode three of The System, at, uh, Legends of the Burn Temple After Show. And even though I mess it up, I'm still going to be your host because no one else is better than me. With me today, I, of course, have the wonderful host of The System, Mr. Nathaniel Rosansky. If he'll just put himself on the screen right here. Look at him being all beautiful. Hello again. again. Hello. Hello, little side commentator. And joining me today are a pair of system all-stars. I had the pleasure of playing with one of them. The other one is kind of... <laughs> with me today, fellow Meme Squad member and only two-time finalist, Miranda. How are you doing? I'm good. It's me, everyone's favorite greasy, unemployed piece of crap. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was really self-depreciating. I'm well, you know, we're, 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 we're running with it. And also joining yeah. me, uh, one of my favorite people postseason, one of the most infuriating people to play with during the season, Mr. Eric. How are you doing? Half of C-SPAN. Hello, hello. This is half of C-SPAN live from the after show. I'm Eric. <laughs> and I'm Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hit you live in my lonely apartment in Chicago, Illinois. Well, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> so, Miranda, how, how's your English class going right now? My English class? Oh, Just Bill's, well, a, Bill's a teacher. I, <laughs> I'm not an actress. <laughs> oh man, I love it. I love well, it. You know, we're struggling, but you know who's struggling even more? The cast of season eight. Let's jump into that. Why don't we? Since that's why we're here. Now, just a little preface, I usually watch the episode once just to take everything, and then I watch the episode again just to take notes and get an idea for how the after show to be. Last time, it was like, even though the episode was like twice as long last time, I had about yay many notes. This time, a lot more. There was a lot to get oh. into. Oh my god, like, I'll, I'll, we'll get into that later, but first of all, we come in fresh up. Weird, weird thing for me, at least. There was no cold open. Nate chose to just say, screw it. We're just jumping straight on in. I do not have the energy to do another great cold open. You yes. only get the first episode. Yes. So we yes. jump in, we get to Rory, and Rory just kind of does his Rory thing where I don't know if he does this on purpose or not, but he is very... Ah, he's like, oh my god, I'm very stressed. I love this game. Oh my god, what's happening? I'm in control. No, I'm not. What's... And it's, it's but he also brings up a very good thing in his first conversation with Cody, where he feels a lot more aware and a lot safer having survived the chamber. And I want, kind of wanted to get your guys' opinions on that because I hadn't actually thought about that until he brought that up, but it brings up the idea of the system version of the intentional Matt Singh, where you kind of put yourself in a very precarious situation, but if you survive, you have like a much better layout of what the game actually is. Do you guys agree? I love Rory. I think he's one of those really big, great characters in the cast right now. And I also think, just in the way he delivers his DRs and everything, just I love his inflection. And I know I also know he's a really strategic player. He's one of those players who has definitely done his research and looked in those past seasons, the, the notes, the episodes. Um, and I, I think he's in a decent spot right now. And I really like how he brought up being in the chamber as maybe a positive because a lot of people they don't know where they stand and they just raise their popularity and um they they have a hard time figuring out who did what but now rory knows okay well you know i got fucked with that's where i'm at but i had enough people to save me and this is how many so absolutely i mean it, it sometimes does pay to be the first person in the chamber you know you you, you find your it gives you this sense of okay maybe i'm not as impenetrable as you think you are in this game and um you start really questioning and start you know, figuring out your game awareness really peaks the minute you realize oh my gosh people are coming after me so uh, i love rory i love the tragedy of comedy and tragedy uh so I i'm rooting for rory <laughs> bill and justin too had a huge wake up call this episode after the last one with jace going home after just trying to you know grab whatever votes he could not really thinking about that good the golden number which i think was three three was the best number last episode or four um and 
Uh, they definitely overcorrected, and I'm sure we'll get to that later, but that made me so happy. That was definitely the highlight of these last couple episodes for me. Oh, oh we, yeah. I have a lot to say about that, but we'll get to that. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to Respect it deserves. <laughs> so we start our conversations. First one is going to be with Rory and Cody. They're kind of breaking us down, picking us up to speed, but we also find out that Cody was part, mainly the reason that Kari was in the chamber, and I have in my notes right there, and this was very prevalent for me and Brian. I had my notes, Cody is canceled. So that was <laughs> the, that's how I felt. Because <laughs> I wanted to see Kari get another chance, but she was also another person we kind of started to see get a little more situated in this game. We saw that with the distribution chat queens kind of yeah. it's kind of interesting because she's never really played this much farther and when i was watching the episode i was watching it with my mom and she mentioned she didn't really play this time so now we're starting to see a second time player play for the first time what was that like to see you know um uh, is it is it kari is kari, it, yeah kari okay kari is somebody i'm keeping my eye on this whole season because, you know, last episode, episode one, she, you know, it's like this, oh, hey, everybody, I'm here. I haven't played as long. And, uh, you know, very green to the system as she only was the first boot in season one. And I think now she's starting to recognize her position in the game. And I think she's in a very good spot going into the later stages of the game. Now the system can be crazy. That's not to say she's gonna go deep, but it definitely suggests that, you know, I have yet to hear a bad thing about Kari throughout the past two episodes. Well, you know, Cody sure recognizes that too. He knows damn well exactly where she stands and he knows that she's his biggest conflict right now. Like Carissa's probably Cody's biggest um, rival right now almost, like his, her, his opposite because she's a purely social game. And I have a feeling that Cody is one of those people who didn't really have a lot of friends on the cast or like know a lot of people beforehand other than Ivy. Um, so I think that that was the best choice he could have made in trying to target her, just seeing what would happen, how many people at her back, and I hope he continues that in the future. So one more thing that Cody says before we move on is that he felt very confident that he, if he were to go into the chamber, he would be saved. I kind of feel like whenever someone says that, it's kind of like the kiss of death. <laughs> And we see it happen so close this time. Like, those are, like, the very few things you never say in the system. Like, you never say that, or I feel like I could win this, or uh, come to you live, this is C-SPAN. You never say those things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. It always depends who you're with, because if you're in there with two people who could have had your back and could have voted and, you know, coordinated with that or gotten info for you, you're kind of screwed. So yeah, it really right. depends on who you're matched up with. Right. A big part of this was observing this happening was that Cody and Ivy thought that they had a lot of control over the game prior to the round one chamber. Um, and then after, and even during that chamber, before Jace was announced that he was gone, they were like, oh, we got this, we control this, like, we have this plan, no one's really talking. What he didn't really, neither of them really realized is that no one was talking to them. <laughs> And from their perspective, everything was locked in because all the discussion happened at the beginning for the voting period and not so much towards the end. And that's when they should have been like thinking like, huh, nobody's talking towards the end of the voting period. And that's, that's really concerning for people who have played more than once or even once, depending on what season you're in, is that if people aren't talking towards the end of the voting period, you're in trouble. Like something is not going the way that you think it's supposed to go. And... Cody and Ivy realize that obviously after Jace goes home and they're like, oh, we're not on top. We're on the bottom. Like, this is not okay at all. <laughs> and that's like the perfect thing. What? Jesus Christ. Okay. Sorry. I have, an, I have an Apple watch. I'm trying to like understand how it works. And it was just speaking some gibberish to me. But we, <laughs> that actually is the perfect segment from Nate to our next little thing. Because, well, Vicky does come in next. She... It go, we'll go into a little more detail about that later and gush about her later, but we get to Bill and Connor, and Bill is in that very same situation. He felt like a little, he felt very lockstep just like Cody and Ivy in the beginning before the chamber results happened. But then after this, you kind of see, I don't want to say a more dejected Bill, but it kind of felt like he lost his Eric and it was like 
with Jace going first, and you kind of see him dejected, confused, trying to figure things out, and a little more hesitant. And I want to get into that, but then we also have Connor, who is playing coy, like, oh yeah, I don't know exactly what happened, but to say that this was not planned and this was an accident overload is naive. So there are two things to this. Bill kind of having like that 180 from where he started and then Connor really like hamming up that he doesn't know as much as he actually does. What are your thoughts on these two? Um, so I can definitely relate to Bill at that moment because that happened to me when uh, with the system Washington. Like, oh, Bill, you're good. Bill, you're good. Bill, you're good. Bill, you have been eliminated. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's that's good to know. And I remember my round three, the very next round after the live, you know, watch the episode. It's, it's fun. Um, but the what ended up happening was I was a little more like uh, gun shy about approaching people, talking to everyone, and just not really taking, I, I really kind of took everything with like a grain of salt, what people were saying to me. So I took a lot of notes on the Bill Connor conversation, and I'm very curious like what Bill was thinking with Connor mentioning all of this. Cause I love Connor, he's one of my favorite people on the planet, but I knew, like if I was in there in real life, I think I said in the live chat during the premiere, I'm like, yeah, I knew he was lying the minute he started talking. Uh, if they're playing coy with you, they're probably not with you at that point. So, But it's kind of sad because I feel like just based on positioning, um, Bill and Connor would work out really well together and they could really link up and share a lot of info with each other and it would just make more sense because, you know, Bill's maybe Justin's priority right now, Justin's number one, but Connor is maybe like pretty low on the totem pole of what he sees as maybe like, he's approaching it more like Survivor. Like they're looking at it as side one versus side two. Oh, we're side two, let's get one of the side one members out because Ivy and Cody are in there instead of thinking, oh, well shit, I'm like number five on side two. Like, what does that do for me? Right, and with the system as well, I mean, as much as you want to think, here's one alliance and here's the other, um, it takes one individual person to think, oh, I'm the bottom man on the totem pole to all of a sudden make a move. Yeah. And uh, so it's it was just so funny seeing that dynamic play out. And I was surprised by the popularity results, but at the same time, looking back, I wasn't surprised at the same time. Yeah, and we'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that later. So now we get to the theme song. Dun, 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 Tonight, we are heroes, and we go straight into the mission. Now, it's the dreaded wall set. We get to see this beautiful shot of Jonah <laughs> taking a face plant after I assume 10 <laughs> seconds on the wall. It was glorious. I do not understand why you do not include that in season four. <laughs> it wasn't season four. You weren't, you weren't paying attention. <laughs> Wait, it was? He took a face plant in the episode? Yes! Yes! Oh, that's God. in the episode! <laughs> oh. Oh wow! And the thing okay. is, the thing is, like I cut it so in episode four, so it, it doesn't look like he got up afterwards, because <laughs> he does get up afterwards, and I, I'm just like, yeah, it's good. So, and I just decided to meme it up a little bit. With that. Yeah, it, it was beautiful. It was great. But we we see this a lot of times where a lot of people don't do really good, but then the people who win, they win hard. And we see this with Grace because everyone else has like one minute, thirty seconds, two minutes, three minutes. Grace has freaking twelve. <laughs> He's sitting up there, just chilling out. I was like, yeah, I got it. what, what, what? And then she like dismounts in the most simple way, like, oh yeah, what up? I have to comment on Blake, by the way. So Blake, um, <laughs> oh, okay. I, I work with Blake. I'm his boss at work, um, and uh, he's a football player. <laughs> Blake, throughout the whole day, he waited to after work to go home and do his submission. The whole day, he was hyping himself up to me, like, oh, I'm gonna get like 10 minutes, I'm gonna get like 15 minutes on this. Like, I do this all the time for football, like, we do it all the time. I have to do it for so long when I do it for football, and I'm just like, all right, buddy, okay. And then he sends me the submission, I'm like, bitch, you said 10 minutes. <laughs> and I roasted him, I'm still roasting him over. Oh, <laughs> you 
I love how Grace won all those prisms, though, because um, and it, she's going to make great use out of them because she's one of those people who can purely selfish with those. And I think it would benefit her the most if she just plays defense like the whole time. If she can keep winning these endurance competitions, depending on how many are there, any other competitions, I think she could totally play defense rather than offense because that's just not where she's positioned right now. So I think that's her best move. Grace is such oh, a every, every mission player. should be wall sit at this point. That was phenomenal. Yeah. Like, oh, um, I what? <laughs> Grace is such an interesting player because she is so fundamentally different than a lot of people that approach system and play system. I think the person, the two people, honestly, that have played the most similarly to Grace is Miranda and Blake. And Blake specifically in season three because he completely changed his style for all stars, but. Her gameplay is very, I need to protect myself first. That is my number one priority. I don't care who I'm with. If I hear for a second my name is out there, it doesn't matter who else is in trouble. As long as I'm safe, I'm good. So that's how she approaches the game and it works for her. And since we're talking about Grace right now, I'm gonna get into it now instead of later. She also is very perceptive of a lot of stuff that's going on in this game, despite a, what people think. And she immediately clocks out the closeness between Justin and Bill, which not a lot of people picked up on. I, I think only her and like two other people yeah, picked exactly. up on that, and she was the first. And she also understood where people viewed her, like especially when her with her inactivity. And she's like, you know what, that's fine. That just means I won't need to communicate as much as people who are in my position would need to, and I'll be able to get away with it, and they won't see me coming. Is these are, I genuinely think this is why you should also worry about the inactive players and not just, yeah. not to call Grace inactive or anything, but from perception, it, it's, you have to worry about everyone. It's not just the people who are very loud and present. Yeah. Like yeah. in season three and season four, I think are the best examples of this, honestly. Uh, just because in season three, um, the first couple eliminations were big move eliminations. Like Ivy was a big move, Bill was a big move, Cody going home was huge. Like those set the tide of the game. And then after that, everyone's like, let's just take out the people that are on the bottom because they're just going, or not on the bottom, that are just kind of floating and not doing anything because why keep them around? They're going to have all the power in them a few rounds. So, and then in season four's case, with the exception of Brian, that would like it was a headhunt for the people that were inactive or not as active as other people. The only person surviving was Jonah, and even then, it took Stefan in the final six to do what he did in order to take Jonah out because no one was going to take him out otherwise. So, yeah. Hi. <laughs> I love so, yeah, Stephen. Grace is dangerous, and she she is she knows what her appearance is, and that is what makes her. Dangerous. Yeah, as long as you have that figured out, you can work off of that. If, as long as you have a game, get to the end, can explain what exactly you did, I'd respect that. And it doesn't really matter as much in this game, which is cool too. No. <laughs> Grace is definitely somebody I'm watching out for. I feel like this was a more powerful episode for her than the last one, and I want to give her a special pop for that. But we're also going to get into something that's just as interesting. The stealing! Oh, I know we have a case of <laughs> someone going steel crazy the first time uh, blue modifiers are available, which are the ones people can use to steal prisms from another, is round two. Sometimes we have them used not at all. In this case, we have them used a plenty. Lucas go, I, I don't want to say steel crazy, but steel crazy, and he steals stuff from not only Bill, but also Ivy. And he's not afraid of it, and he's also not afraid to let people know about it. Like, I have this written down somewhere. It was stealing it, yeah, um, he, he doesn't really care because, yeah, he is going after them. And I want to hear what your guys' thoughts are on that. Okay, so I took a lot of notes on this part because I think this may have, you know, if I'm putting myself in Bill's spot, that may have been the best thing to do, to just draw attention to the fact that somebody stole my prisms because you've just gotten out of a round where, you know, where Jace left on a blind side and you've got pe perceptions of people that are like, oh my gosh, people are being shady. So why not add fuel to the fire and say, well, somebody stole my prisms. Hmm, shady, 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 right? So that, I think that was so perfect for Bill to do that. 
Um, I And you know what? I got to give it to Lucas. Uh, at first, I'm like, mm, you know, maybe round two, Prism, mm, that may not be. But if you're Lucas and you want to get a rise out of Bill or a rise out of Ivy, that's the best way to do that. But what I, I love Oh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> no, continue. Yeah. Oh, um, but, but what I didn't like was Lucas sharing that he stole the prisons. I think he should have just kept that under wraps, blamed that on the other people. And, but that, that was the only thing I didn't like. But I think Bill played that perfectly. I think Lucas played it perfectly until he started talking about it. I actually think it was a bad move on Lucas's part, um, just based on he was furthering that side war in doing that, in stealing both of their prisms. It was pretty obvious he was pushing that whole side war agenda even more. And really that only helped Bill, Ivy, Justin, even more. And Bill was talking about, oh yeah, as long as I have, he was talking about wanting to have visible enemies. And I think it was the pre previous episode or this one. So he has the right idea. And I think that really helped him, if anything. And I don't think it helped Lucas. And obviously he he's not in a good spot at the end of this. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> Uh, Nate, do you have anything? Yeah, so Lucas made an error, and it, and I, I don't think it's necessarily bad to steal from someone early. I mean, we've seen it work out very well for people in the past. Ame comes to mind with stealing early and causing paranoia, so it exposes more cards. Um, however, uh, in this case, Lucas really shouldn't have done that, <laughs> it, it, I, in my opinion. <laughs> I would not have done that if I was in his position, simply because his name was all over the place in round one. Um, drawing more attention to yourself after that happening in a bad light is not okay. Like that's, you need people to forget about you if you were almost in the chamber, but weren't. Like that, that is the thing. Like you need to make sure you're not in the next chamber. So Lucas, uh, like, t like one, his first mistake was doing that. Second mistake was telling people he did it. And that was that was really, really bad for his game in my opinion. Yeah. And it's not like, in um, complimentary, complimentary to what Miranda said, it, it wasn't also something that people couldn't pick up on. Like, Ames, no one could suspect that. But with something with these two specific people, Ivy easily clocked that, even though no one told her. She was like, oh, it was probably Lucas. Well, Jojo clocked it first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of like, uh, a little too obvious. You want to make sure that if you do steal, that it can't be traced back to. I think it would be wise if, like, Rory or Blake were, like, or, like, even Vic, well, maybe not Vicky again, but Blake or Rory were ones to steal from, like, two people in this second side. Like, the kind of bigger side with Vicky, Lucas, Connor. Well, not Lucas anymore, but I feel like that could benefit them but not Lucas. Yeah. So then moving on, we get into the last little bit of strategy before the uh, popularity results. I just had to think of how this game works. And we get to see the distribution chat queens in work discussing really what this episode has kind of been building off of, this little side war. And it seems to be mostly everyone so focused on getting season three, all of it into the chamber and all Ivy, Cody, and Bill. And I don't want to, I, I see where they're coming from, but there's also season seven that has four people. And I don't want to tell you how to play the game, but I would be more concerned of a bigger, bigger season coming in. Yeah, there's like season seven and then there's, didn't Vicky and Blake say that they're like tight and no one's pinpointing it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One thing that wasn't in the episode was that uh, Blake accidentally slipped to Connor and, and like in the first round that he and Vicky had a final two in season six and Vicky was like, shut up, shut up. <laughs> like, that would have been great. Whoops. If it was <laughs> I unfortunately didn't have the footage anymore, uh, but that's, yeah, that, that was slipped and Connor picked up on that. He's not stupid. Um, and Vicky was just, she said in her confessional, I'm so mad at Blake for saying that. Like, why the hell would you say that? <laughs> so, Eric, how is it seeing your entire season representation getting targeted? Um, uh. just for, I don't want to say just for being season three, but like, you know, just your friends, your, your fan. Right. I mean, it, it, it made sense because of you know the, what had happened with Jace, like oh, so 
it's kind of like this realm of when you're trying to take an individual game, an individual section of the game like the system, and trying to project this herd mentality, let's go after the group that we just targeted last round. And I mean, it, it doesn't work like that. I mean, I can point to, you know, the cabinet season three. Oh, we're so lucky. We're going to get, you know, Alex and Cody and, and everybody in the, in the chamber. And it just doesn't work like that. <sighs> People don't learn. <laughs> you can't get an entire <laughs> line into the chamber. You might as well just target one or two and then just put all your eggs in that basket. Like at most. I mean, it, it's kind of like we, Nate says, no one ever learns. We have episodes on this. Like, people should be picking up every so often. Yeah. So, I think they that's should, but people get greedy. <laughs> that's all, why. Their own fault. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to season five's The Situation. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yeah. Um, one thing I do want to say is is that, yes, the the uh, distribution chat queens did get a little greedy, but that was also because they didn't really have a lot of room to maneuver. The problem is when you have such a dominating group over a small group is that you don't have many moves to go from for there. Vicky didn't have that huge group in the previous round until the votes were locked in. So she was able to maneuver a lot easier, but because this round there's a group of six or seven people that collectively wants three or four people out of the game, it's a lot harder to kind of really make that work and make it like stick. Yeah, because it's a game about prying for information and hoping that people from the wrong side slip up and give you information they shouldn't so you can put that together and do what you need to. And when there's a bunch of people on one side versus a smaller side, okay, it's a side war. What are you guys going to do if it's very defined and there's no ties in between? But then again, you have people like Grace who will tell Ocho, you know, what they what they need to know. So, I mean, people are unpredictable, like things can change, but in you know, in theory, like, a side war is really, really lame, and... <laughs> lame. We don't like it, even though it happens a lot. Uh, <laughs> so, the chamber... Uh, no, not chamber. The popularity results come in. We see Ivy. We see Cody. We see Lucas in the chamber. When you have a duo that you're, like, really close to in the chamber, it's, I don't want to say discouraging, but in All-Stars, when that happened to me in Oakley twice, it was a ringer the first time and it was rough the second time. I, I can only imagine how it's been like, I, you guys have had that kind of experience too, right? Where you're in the chamber with an ally and there's only, it seems like there's only one way out, but. It's Eric and hard. Henning, Miranda and Dustin. Mm -hmm. like, yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it, it can be very discouraging. It's, you know, when Henning and I ended up going into the chamber, it's when you kind of knew, and, and it was that live night where everybody was talking about the vote, and like, you, at one, at selfishly, it's like you want to protect yourself, but at the same time, you want to protect, you know, Henning as well, or your, your, your ally as well, and uh, it, it was very, yeah, it's, it, it can be, it can really kill your game at times. Lest we forget Miranda's choice, but that had a twist in it as well. But <laughs> Stephen, I'm, I'm sure that wasn't great either. I mean, it, 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 I want to say it led to some really great TV on the system, <laughs> so it's not yeah. all bad. And, I mean, like, I don't know, I, we've beaten this to death. I didn't want to win All Star, so like, if it helped you in Oakley, I'm very fine with that. Sorry. By the way, oh, I wanted to. Oh, sorry, Miranda, please continue. <laughs> I was just saying silver linings. Silver okay. linings. I do want to say, not to backtrack, but, like, the difference was between Season 3 and Season 7, not just that, that Season 3 was, like, they voted to try to keep Jace in together, but it was also because they had more of a public appearance of being together and being more uniform than Season 7 was. Uh, the Season 3 people, they were connected. Granted, it was not, like, the best connection, but it was obvious that Bill took out Ivy, Cody took out Bill. Granted, that is not like a great game connection, but it's an obvious game connection, an easy one to connect over. Whereas season seven, they were all over the place. Like Rory was taken out by a twist. Uh, Lucas was the first boot, and the only real person he was obviously connected to was Lucas. Even then, they didn't really play long together. Jake took out Grace, but it wasn't like an obvious thing. Jake was also a part of a dominant alliance that collectively wanted Grace out. So the the fact of the matter is is that season seven is just 
was nowhere near as unified or had that appearance of being unified as season three was. Okay. Um, going in a little after that, we now yes. get into a little confessionals. Ivy's dejected, feeling a little more lost. Cody, for whatever reason, a little shady of me, but I was like, why are you proud of being in the chamber, sir? <laughs> I don't understand that. And it has been like, un I don't want to say unnecessarily sassy, but he's been overly sassy this season. <laughs> In his editing. <laughs> now, 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 in Cody's defense, in Cody's defense, we love Cody. Cody's fantastic. This was a guy who just got wheeled in season three. So, better to be in the chamber than to be wheeled. So, uh, well, it's also not was, final 12. There's no possibility of the wheel right now. He was clearly <laughs> being sarcastic, but I'm just like, I'm going to have fun with this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Um, lest we not forget the next piece of shady editing, let's check out how Jake is doing. <laughs> <laughs> what did he even say? I couldn't figure it out. It he said, like, sorry, I have mints. Like, that's what he said. For a second, so, it was his goddamn teeth falling out. So, the, the thing is with Jake is that, like, the thing is, I, I'm going to touch upon this when we get to the Jojo Bill part, but I can't show what I don't have. Um, and this season we did not require people to have recorded conversations because going into the season we were not planning to make episodes. So for this round, I had no recorded conversations of Jake. And he was still talking to people, he was still keeping up with people, he was alive in the game, but he just didn't have anything recorded. The only thing I had were his mission submission for the round and his confessional. So I can't really just insert Jake, like no matter how I inserted Jake into the episode, it was going to be weird and a little awkward. So I'm like, let's just make a joke out of it. And to be fair, Jake do did have an appearance at that point in time as a major floater. He was not someone that was like a super big threat. The first round, he was just very concerned about not going to the chamber because season seven was like, don't put season seven in, please, we're not together. And he was like, okay, cool, I survived that, I can float. So that was Jake that whole round. And like, that was the best representation I could put of him without it being like super, super awkward and just kind of jammed in without it being funny. Okay, now moving on, we're gonna go talk, we're finally going to talk about Vicky in a little more detail. So it, we start the episode where she's talking about, yeah, I, I wanna make sure everyone in my alliances are valued and they feel like they're valued. So if someone's going around taking claim to it, I'm gonna let them, but bitch, I did that. And we see her not just once, but multiple times, and we see other people commenting on too, that she is letting Dustin, I, I kind of made this like similarity between me and Justin in season four, where I kind of got his head on track and then pushed him in the direction that he needed to go in order to benefit my game. Vicky kind of did the same thing, let Dustin do his thing, and people are being more focused on Dustin. And I feel like that is a very, that's a big strategy. And then you have Dustin who's feeling very secure in his spot. Do you feel like, what do you guys feel about this kind of strategy? So um, I, I think Vicky, like for this kind of game, and even, even Connor kind of alluded to this earlier in the episode too, like this idea of, you know, let everybody else kind of do their thing. Let, let them get the blood on their hands. As long as I'm sitting pretty, they're not saying my name and they're not gonna throw me into the chamber. Or at least that's the idea of the strategy. And if you asked me from episode one to episode two, I would say to you, I'm scared for Vicky because you know she she's clearly has made herself a big target with the move that she made, but I'm actually digging what she's doing here right now because it, it takes the limelight, limelight out of her and putting it back on Dustin. I'm more scared for Dustin. I think Vicky's in a better position right now than Dustin is because Vicky's the center of quite a few things, like a couple things going on right now. Whereas Dustin seems like he's kind of at the bottom of that side two alliance. He, I know he did talk to people and maybe that it wasn't shown, but it doesn't seem like he was really a big focus point of anyone's confessionals or really played that big of a role. So him taking that responsibility, he makes a good scapegoat. Like it happened in season two, like he'll probably take the fall for that. I'm more concerned for Dustin. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. One, one one interesting thing is that a lot of people kind of at this point in time view Vicky and Dustin as the power couple. While Blake and Vicky had the notori notoriety of coming in as a duo, it has shifted completely because Blake just isn't as active as Dustin. So it's really worked well for Blake and Vicky as a pair because they are definitely closer 
together than Vicky is to Dustin at this point in time. Because now Vicky is like, yeah, I made the first move, but I'm not in control necessarily. There's Dustin right here. Everybody, Dustin did this, not me. So, and Dustin is also talking more than her. Yeah, at this point in time and that's what people are going to be looking at and now people's viewpoints are changing because they're like was vicky really completely in control of that because i i don't know if that's the case anymore so nate i'm going to quote something you said probably in like a season three after show that mm -hmm. i remember for the longest time but this is what it comes down to um in every ride or die like in the system there seems to be a godfather and there seems to be a mafioso and mm -hmm. dustin seems to be taking on that role and that, you know, I'm nervous for Dustin. I mean, he might make it to later stages of the game, but I don't know. I think history is going to repeat itself for him. There are too many patterns and parallels that he's not correcting right now, but maybe he can in this next episode. I, I do want to say, though, just in defense of Dustin, that he is playing significantly better than he did the first time around. And this Amen. is also the... This is also the opinion of the rest of production when Henning was a part of production. This is also the case um, where whenever we like finish the season, you'll be able to see like, oh yeah, Dustin definitely improved on what he did the first time. Depending on whether or not that changes his placement, we shall see. But with Dustin specifically, yes, his social game way better this time around in terms of his viewpoint and how, thing, how the game is going much better this time around. It's just the one thing that I think that is not doing him any service is that he's not understanding his own position at this point in time. Yeah. So now we go into what I think is the greatest segment in the episode, if not in all of System episode history. Um, it's, it's up there. I'm not going to say it's the greatest thing, but it's very entertaining because we go from Justin's chat with Grace, where she says, oh yeah, I think there are five people saving Lucas. You see just his <laughs> eyes going, what? And then we cut immediately to the League of Chillin', which every time I say that, I get like, oh, I, I like cringe just so much. <laughs> it hurts. Every League of Villain pun, every League of Hero thing, every League of Chillin', I am done with it. It is over. Um, <laughs> we see them break down everything. We see Bill be a little hesitant. And Justin is like saying, no, you got to save Lucas. We got to cause this overload. Yes, it is very risky, but we got to take this chance, dude. And my favorite line of the episode, we came here for a second chance. Fucking do it, bro. And Bill caves and he's like, you know what? You're right. I'm going to do it. I personally think Bill was so apprehensive of doing that was because of his system history with how uh, the vote went when he left with the vote when Jace left. And now this one where he's like in control this last vote. He, of course, I would be apprehensive if every time before it's been like that. But, you know, just seeing it all come together. Production was very entertained in this moment. But with 10 minutes left, like, it came down to the goddamn buzzer. And we see the League of Chillin' pull off the second overload in a row. <laughs> Please, what were you guys thinking when this was going on? Yeah, Justin's my MVP for this <laughs> So uh, Vicky's obviously the one, well, not maybe not obviously, but mine for the last one. And, you know, Justin and Bill, that was really impressive that Justin managed to get that information at the last second. I don't know what compelled Grace to tell that to him. Like what made, you know, her think that the lines were blurred like that, but he's doing something right, so. All right, so I'm gonna be giving my unbiased opinion of what C-SPAN, when League of Chillin' was able to do, hang on, is it hot in here? Is it hot in here? Is it, is it hot in here or is it just me? Hang on, give me a moment here. <laughs> moment here. <laughs> <laughs> so let me break this down. I had to go all the way back, system history here. I remember season one, Josh Felix throwing the vote to get Max out. I remember you know, Nick Mana changing his vote season five to get Don out. I remember, I have never seen a play like this in eight seasons of system history. I, League of Chillin, uh, they, we're gonna, they're, it's, it's beyond C-SPAN. This is what C-SPAN was supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just so thrilled for both of them. Bill dug deep, he's learned, Justin, all right, one more thing, one more thing. A little bit of system trivia for you. Justin was my system alumni recommendation for season four. 
So I felt like a proud papa bear seeing Phil and Justin put that together. You have no idea how thrilled I am. Uh, like, it was phenomenal. I loved it. You guys are fantastic. <laughs> so happy for them, especially that bounce back from the last episode. The last episode, you're like, I don't know, not looking too great for them. They bounced back. They found out where they were after this epi- after that episode, and they know how to get further. Yep. Uh, one thing that wasn't in the edit again, it's like if I don't have it, I can't show it, um, is that Bill actually purposely said at the beginning of the round for voting, it was like, I am going to be the last person to vote. I am going to wait until the end because I need to know everything I can. And there's a possibility it could overload because of the fact that nobody wants to give Cody or Ivy votes. At the moment, they still don't know which one they want gone. So they were, he was like, there's a possibility. I'm gonna keep my vote. I'm not gonna tell anybody that I didn't vote. And that's it. Nobody knew Bill was the last vote except JoJo. And that was it. So that like, and that's why, I think that's why Grace felt comfortable enough to tell uh, to tell JoJo that there were five people that had locked in for Lucas. Cause when I think she might've assumed that Bill was going to anyway, or just either vote for Cody or Ivy, where his vote just kind of just didn't matter in her head. And then on top of that, she didn't know Bill was the last one to vote. She thought it was one of her own people. She thought the likeliness was that there were seven people that were like, yeah, I'm going to just wait until the end, make sure that everything's Gucci, and then I'll vote. And nobody knew it was Bill <laughs> until after the vote, which you'll see after in the next episode. But it was, yeah, like it was an insane. People really underestimate Jocho. And I, I want to, again, I want to give props to Jocho. People assume because his mouth is running a lot that his eyes aren't looking as much as well. Jojo is one of the best perceptions of the playing field out of m- the majority of the people in this cast. Amen. Amen. And that's something he learned from season four. Yeah. Like, I think you see, like, I think he, you see this in the episode where he feels worried a bit more about where his loyalties are. People are like, you know, going to give him information. I think that's kind of the problem of people, of being such an active person in season four. Uh, people aren't as willing to trust him, but I think he was one of the people who definitely has picked up and learned from his past. Um, even though he didn't feel it in the beginning that he had to side, I think he now clearly has to side. Yeah, and, and, and Jocho, he, <laughs> this is why I think, you know, and Nate, you, you brought it up. Jocho is, like I know people like to say, oh, Jocho's not a great player. This just proved it. This just proved otherwise. This just proved that he knew exactly what to say to Bill to finally, because I can, I, I know Bill and he's thinking through this and, you know, who knows, like, we don't know who Bill talked to prior to this conversation, but, you know, and you can even see Bill's gears start to turn. And there's even a moment where we kind of steps back a little bit, like, okay, well, wait a minute, let's figure this out. And then that's when Justin comes in and says, we came here for a second chance. He knew exactly what to say. I mean, I was trying to find my Febreze and like get the messy thing. (laughs) Bear in mind, Justin had more to gain from this move than Bill did. And Bill gained a lot. Like it was great risk, high reward for Bill and he's gonna explode phenomenally in in the next episode, I'm sure. But Justin had a lot less to lose by this move too. That's why I'm just like, this is greatly going to benefit my game and it's not going to kill me because nobody's going to associate me with this move. So, pr- bravo to both of them. I mean, League of Chillin. I'm a League of Chillin fan. Yeah, I think this episode was really their breakout episode for proving themselves as the two of the more strategic players on the yeah. cast. Yeah. Um, one thing that I wrote in my notes for round one, episode one, was that uh, Jocho had, I, I, I had like rankings in my notes and everything, and I put on there as like, Jocho needs to figure out how to not necessarily change his perception, but make it so his perception isn't a bad thing. And the perception was, was that it's Jocho. He's going to be talking to people. Like, and people were like, oh, like people need, like I have to dance around what I tell Jocho and like be careful about exactly because he's he's gonna tell everybody. He needed to figure out a way to make it so it was, it went, the, oh, it's Jocho, to, oh, that's just Jocho. And he found it this time. So, and it was really a sight to see. Yeah. And now, of course, that led to the infamous 6 to 2 to 2 overload, the second one in the season. And we see Lucas leaving 
in 13th place once again. He is, uh, the, he is the second person in system history to repeat placements, of course, the first being Nick Mana. Now, what, what do you guys, do you feel like this is a very fair placement for Lucas? Um, what do you think his legacy is in the system now? And what are your final thoughts? I think he's made quite a few missteps. I, I don't think it was a coincidence. I think he kind of brought himself there in a couple of ways. Um, not too shocked, but I don't think it was him that did himself in, in the long run, obviously. But yeah, <laughs> I think he earned his place there. <laughs> I, I was a big fan of Lucas uh, in, in the first episode, in the second episode, and I, I thought he, maybe he was going to just miss the jury or something. So this placement doesn't necessarily, it surprised me. I'm, I'm sad by it, but at the same time, there's a golden rule in the system. When you are ahead and you're in a good spot, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, but chaotic. Very yes. chaotic for no, when, when it wasn't the right time to be. Yeah. I, I think part of it was, is that like, is that Lucas wasn't used to being ahead. Um, and he, he was used to knowing what he was talking about after the fact. And that, that was the case in season seven. He, he knew what he was doing in season seven to an extent as a newbie player. Um, he knew this wasn't Big Brother or Survivor. He knew that was the wrong way to approach the game. And unfortunately, because there were multiple people that didn't approach it that way, he got screwed over. And this time he actually was able to benefit from the fact that people weren't, were approaching it like the system. And, but unfortunately, he didn't have the experience that other player, players had, and that's where he fell short this time. And that's really where I saw the disconnect for Lucas. I think it was just an unfortunate, like, series of things that kind of led to it. And again, not completely his fault. Definitely things were his fault that landed him in that position. Um, but there were just, a, like, little things here and there that maybe could have gone a little bit better for Lucas and he would be a, a little bit farther in the game, maybe. Um, one thing that interests me is like, how does Rory deal with this? <laughs> um, because now Rory, um, if you've been paying attention to Rory, Rory talks a lot to the people that are perceivably on the bottom. He talks to Bill, he talks to Cody, but Lucas, he's tied to Lucas, who's on with Vicky, with Carrie, with Dustin. Where does Rory go now? <laughs> is really the question that I, I have put this in my notes. And that, that's one thing. To the bar to grab a beer. This was a weird round. <laughs> yes. Uh, Rory should go to Dustin, but Dustin, I don't think, has the awareness of where he is right now to do that. But I think that would be the best for both of them right now. Maybe Rory, Dustin, and Bill would be good for Rory, but I feel like... Continue. I'm trying to. <laughs> no problem. So we're, we're moving I on. Chart, I have a chart yeah. right here of these connections. And I'm, like, oh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna make a bold <laughs> statement here. I think Rory is just riding with with season three. Personally, um, I think now I see Rory as somebody who's kind of playing that MTR middle of the road kind of game, and you might as well go where the power is at this moment in time. I'm going to be very curious what happens in the first 10 minutes of episode three, because I'm going to be watching for Rory. I'm going to be watching for Bill. I'm going to be which, watching out for, you're going to love my new code name, Code Ivy. Uh, <laughs> to, uh, they they to actually refer to themselves as Team Rocket. Oh, yeah. From this point on. Oh. They do. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they are Team Rocket. Uh, I think yep. they... Um, Specifically Jesse sure. and James, but they are Team Rocket. Were they round, was it round two or round three? I think it was round three. Uh, it was beginning of round three, but I think, but so about this time. But yeah, they, yeah. they consider themselves Team Rocket. They know that they are villainous and they don't care that people are yeah. villainous. Um, <laughs> I love that even better. Prepare for trouble and <laughs> double. Um, and then you can just imagine a prod as Meowth and Wobble Fett just like chiming in, just being, yep. just being stupid. Um, mm -hmm. But. Before we wrap it up, I just want to get your guys' final thoughts. What do you guys think is going to be happening next? Who do you think is going to leave next? And who do you think is going to win? You're not going to ask us who we think is going to win. Not going to work this time. Nope. <laughs> All right. So. I don't think Ivy's in good for next episode. And I don't think. I could see it going bad for Grace. Like, she might be in trouble, but I feel like she'll fix herself. Um. Yeah, we'll we'll have to see because it really depends on whether they um, really pay attention to the flo like the floating the, the floating people in the middle right now because it's not just two sides. There's like 
four different ones that she really Two big moves just happen in a row, and typically when that happens, people want to take some shots at the middle, so... It yeah. was like Pangea, now it's like two... <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's a good comparison. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so there was something I, I wanted to take note of, and it's going to connect to my thoughts for who's going next and who possibly wins. Uh, during Lucas's elimination and giving his goodbye to the rest of the house, I watched Lucas make his comments, and I listened, but I was watching for eyes and watching for the people in the uh, in the squares. And uh, Ivy's excited and I'm, I'm so I'm so glad for Ivy. I love her and I'm so glad she's gonna, she's gonna stick around too. But I was watching for Justin and Bill because of Bill and Justin in their previous seasons, you know, I, I go back to mine with Cody, you know, basically telling him get to step in when he got on the wheel. You know, that would have been probably Bill and Justin maybe two, like season three, season four. But I looked at both of them and they looked so stoic. Like, don't mess with us. We are here. We have learned how to play. I, I'm prepared. I don't want to jinx it. I, I believe one of them's going to at least make jury. I'm, I don't want to say both of them because I think Grace is onto them. But I think one of them's at least going to make jury. I'm prepared to say that now. As far as who do I think is going to go, I'm, if I'm Justin, I should take Grace's information and run with it. I think Grace is in trouble this round. Um, and then, you know, if I'm Bill and I'm reading Connor correctly, I I should just make the move on Connor personally. But that's just me, um, you know. And my winner pick, <sighs> my dream would be Bill and Justin. Maybe they go deep. I don't know. Uh, but I got to root for my, I got to root for C-SPAN. I'm rooting for you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Miranda, I'm not sure we got a winner pick from you. Oh, yeah, but no, um, adding on to what I said and what Eric was saying, like, it really depends on um, where, if they're, if anyone's able to pinpoint, like, what exactly happened other than Bill and Justin. If anyone else catches on to that, I can see where it would go wrong. Maybe Grace doesn't even realize that she went wrong in saying that, so she might not know that she's in trouble or be in trouble, who knows. But um, my two winner picks right now is... I, I believe in Vicky. I really, really like her as a player and a character this season. And I'm I'm also hoping for Bill and Just, Justin, Justin, Bill and Just, Justin to make it to the end. The League of Chillin'. League of Chillin'. You have to root for the League of Chillin' after this. Oh. I, I do want to say, I, I want to give a little bit of a story behind those last 10 minutes that you saw. Henning was the only production member that was on that call oh, watching yeah, that. Okay. Stefan wasn't, wasn't there. I was visiting with Vicky and I was just like, okay, I'm just going to wait till the votes and then I'll leave the room and then I'll, I'll announce. I get a message from Henning because I'm just checking my phone. And he's just like, you need to get on this call now. You need to watch now. And I'm like, why? What's happening? And he's like, you know, Bill is the last one to vote, right? And I'm like, Oh, I'll join the call. <laughs> like, and we're all of us are on call watching what they're deciding. We're just like, we're messaging like, Bill, listen to JoJo, listen to JoJo, make the move, Bill, make the move. <laughs> so it was nuts. Like, it was, uh, it was definitely something else because I was watching this from an outside, outside perspective because Matt and Nate were just like eyes on the flies on the wall, just like eating this up and like talking at each other. And I'm sitting here like, what the fresh hell is going on? <laughs> now I you know. joined him in the last like two minutes, I think. What you joined. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. I was kind of like exhausted at this point and was only like, <laughs> dude, these people are exhausting. But you know what's not exhausting? Another episode of the system. After show, Legend of the Burn Temple. Oh crap, it's it. That's over. We're not going over an hour, I swear to God. <laughs> okay, everyone, I just wanted to thank you guys. Hold on, hold on, Stefan. Son of a bitch. Nine. Right. <laughs> season nine. <laughs> oh, right, season nine. So let's go, let's hype that up. So guys, season nine, we are planning to cast our ninth season, our next movie season. If you want to play, throw an application on it. You know a friend or family member? Throw their application in. I got my mom to play a season. You kids do. <laughs> so, with that being said, if you're, there's something strange in the neighborhood, uh -huh. give it a call. C fan. Okay. God damn it. Okay, well, anyway, <laughs> that's it. This is the for real ending. 
apply to the system season nine again thank you to miranda and eric and nate for joining me once again for the system after show legends of the burn temple i will see you next time goodbye